Jonathan and I founded Bobolink Dairy and Bakehouse in 2002 uh, because it was a project that needed to happen. Uh, the primary uh, business of Bobolink Dairy, well, it was originally just Bobolink Dairy, to do 100% grass-fed raw cow's milk cheeses. And uh, because Jonathan and I have had this huge bread hobby since he was three and since I was eight, we thought we would just bake a little on the weekends. And uh, we built a single chamber wood-fired oven. Uh, this is actually our second single chamber wood-fired oven. We were on a leased farm from 2002 to 2008 where we did an Alan Scott single chamber, um, 42 wide by 48 deep oven. Uh, Jonathan, who is an engineer, uh, designed a system by which we could monitor the levels of the different levels of masonry. And now in our new farm, we built a, a four foot wide by six foot deep oven with improvements in terms of the monitoring of the different heat levels. I'm just gonna talk really fast. Um, we can monitor the heat levels of this single chamber wood fired oven through thermocouples, which actually broadcast out to the internet, which we can see on our cell phones. So I actually am watching the oven right now. Uh, and uh, the biggest aha of uh, three years ago was that Jonathan put a robotic arm on the flue damper so that during firing we can open and close the flue damper from remote anywhere in the world and uh, see what's going on. So um, this is the baker's side which is in the building. The whole oven is outside the building and we have a back door where we feed the wood for the firing. So um, the fire end uh, has two doors, an inner door and an outer door, so we have that deep doorway. Uh, and um, the biggest challenge with an Allen, has anybody ever uh, worked with an Allen Scott oven? So the big challenge with, this, with the single chamber is building your fire, you have to keep your fire close to the front and then push it back what we call, well, when it's well lit because your flute generally is at your baker's door with uh, this oven, because we've decided we want to do our wood handling outside and not be bringing wood into the bakehouse, because this is a bake house, not a bake yard. Um, so uh, we are now able to build the fire basically at the back, and the flue is against the building, so we have the airflow going through. Uh, but we built a double door on the outside so that we have the insulation so that there's no, not a cold spot in the back. Where you normally have a hot spot in the back, we now have a cold, potentially a cold spot in the back. But generally, our heat is even throughout. So I start by talking about the oven because um, I, when I was four years old, I went to Colonial Williamsburg and just got obsessed with making everything by hand from the very basic elements. And you know, I was trying to grow, I'm the child of two New York City school teachers and was trying to grow carrots in the you know, suburban subdivision. Uh, but uh, as we went along, I learned more and more about how it was done long ago. So certainly wood fire baking was high on my uh, list of things to do. So besides dealing with the unpredictability of artisanal flour, we're also dealing with needing to have our doughs ready when the oven is ready for them. And then within that, if you have any problem with your dough or your production, you have to burn more wood yesterday to have enough heat to support what you need to do today. So our production has a very long arc of planning. Uh, we have three doughs that have 24 hour ferments. And two of those doughs have a 24 hour oat pre-soak. So I can't have a customer call me and ask for an extra dozen of those <laughs> today <laughs> because I need to plan ahead, three days ahead for those breads. Um, but what we get is pretty gnarly looking bread. Uh, so this is our, midi we call it the medieval event because we suppose that this is what Robin Hood and his merry men would have eaten. <laughs> 
Uh, and that is whole soaked oat groat with um, farmer ground whole rye and uh, farmer ground whole wheat and about 10% of uh, Champlain Valley's meadow, which is an all purpose. So that's running in the 11.5 to 12% protein department, which lets me have this heavy duty gnarly bread that still has a lightness to it and a, and a strong enough wall for some gas uh, expansion and those strong bubbles um, that you spoke of. So uh, our starter for this bread is a, a starter that we began in 2003 with a bottle of Saison du Pont, Belgian ale, and we've been bringing that forward since then. So it's a very complex and versatile starter. It's not as obviously sour as a sourdough, but it is the concept of bringing your microbial uh, polyculture forward from day to day and from year to year. Um, the heirloom fife, made, made all with red fife, and it can be played on occasion. And uh, so thank you, Omer. <laughs> and this is 100% red fife. Uh, we, are, we began a starter with the red fife only uh, and ran that for about four weeks to make sure that it was only red fife. If there's a molecule or two left, of meadow in there, you know, so there's, you know, a hair follicle from Benjamin Franklin as well. Um, but what I, I created this bread in response to my adamant uh, opposition to gluten-free baking. And, um, you know, standing, standing at Green Market, uh, you know, do you have spelt bread? Do you have gluten-free bread? No, no, no. And I have nothing against spelt, guys. I really want to use spelt. But using spelt at this time in history in the redefinition of gluten sensitivity, I need to avoid things that are popular culture avoidance of gluten. And I'm working on using genetics that people ate forever so that I can do my one-liner. Do you have any gluten-free bread? No, I have heirloom bread. I have the bread that everyone ate before 1900. And nine times out of 10, they will buy an heirloom fife or my medieval event and they will come back and say, okay, I'm fine, what else do you have? And work their way through our entire product line and be just fine. So that's my mission right now, and so I so appreciate being able to get the raw materials that I need for this mission. Now, I'm tiny, tiny. Tomorrow is a big day, we're making 500 pieces. But that's not very big at all. It's, it's too big to be small and too small to be big. Uh, we are mixing in a 30 quart Hobart. We are proofing in 20 pounds and 30 pounds in proofing bins. Um, for the most part, I try to proof it ambient, although right now in our renovated barn, our ambient temperature is 60 degrees and it's just not good enough. So we started moving our proofing bins over to the wood stove and then we have to turn them because you've got your dough doing this. Uh, and we finally, after three years in this space, rigged up a proofing box. Uh, and it, it's working pretty well. And we mix, you know, we mix warm and we keep our average dough temperature going. Because once we divide and put those doughs out on the peels, they really stop. <laughs> um, but we're used to working with cold fermentation. And I find generally, without get, getting too technical and spending too much time, if I do a good initial fermentation with enough heat to get a lot of microbial <coughs> activity going, then it will continue to coast, so I'll, I'll be looking for an initial high rate of fermentation, and then I have enough microbial activity in there that it can just level off into a, a slower plane, which helps me tremendously at controlling when the dough is ready, when the oven is ready. Uh, 12 years into running a single chamber wood-fired oven, I have a pretty good idea of the trajectory of the oven heat and how we can slow it down, slow down the drop of temperature or speed up the drop of temperature to accommodate the dough 
different times of the year. I mean, summer baking is a totally different experience than winter baking. And I find that even if our ambient temperature in the bakery is 80, if it's a 95 degree, 95% 95 humidity day outside, my doughs will go faster just the same. One of the things that I have the latitude to do in terms of dealing with artisanal flours and some unpredictabilities in production is I have a range of acceptable outcomes that uh, are within my aesthetic, both visual and mouthfeel. Um, I also have a sales force that understands how to portray that to our customer base. And I have a customer base that loves what we do and does anything to support us. So when I do have um, a mishap and I found out, you know, I, and all of my friends have at least three grains in them. So when I do have a production inconsistency, uh, sometimes I don't really know where it's coming from, and if it's one batch and one bag, uh, I don't necessarily have to dig too deeply. I just know what to do with that 30 pounds of dough right now, which is often keep folding, form it late, and get it into the oven really fast once it's done its final form. Uh, you know, I had some of my flaxseed loaves. They, they just, the dough just kept sinking. We tighten it up, it would stand up, and then within 10 minutes, even on a cold day, it was falling down. So we just had to roll it up, roll it up, get it on the peel, slice, 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 into the oven, and it was okay. And it was actually one of the most delicious batches of that bread that we had. And it was probably something to do with the sugar levels in the flours that had our starter really happy and eating and and it was just breaking down the gluten as fast as we could tighten it up. And we have the latitude to do that and to deal with that. Uh, and I think that's, that may be more why the restaurants are fine too, because they can have each batch be a little different and that's, that's the bread du jour. Uh, so we do 15 different breads and I've branched out into some biscuits where I'm combining um, a soft wheat with an all-purpose wheat, rolling in some of our own cheese, and we just use all our cheese scraps, grate them up, roll them in, it's delicious. Um, I've mixed the red fife with uh, an all-purpose flour, 50-50, local apples, little cinnamon, and I'm not afraid of sugar, so just a little sugar to make a really nice breakfast pastry that's not too sweet. And uh, you know, when people see I have biscuit up, and they're like, is it too sweet? No, you're gonna love it. And you know, we have things that are gnarly and hearty, but without being so heavy that you could also use them to hold the door open. Uh, <laughs> and and you know, I started baking my own breads in the, in the 70s in in an attempt to make a more interesting, lighter. You know, because a lot of us hippy dippies in the 70s, we were eating some stuff. You might as well just go out in the backyard and bake. <laughs> you know, it was pretty rough stuff. And there's still a lot of that on the market, and, and I cherish it. But at the same time, to appeal to a wider market or people who really want to do the right thing for their own health and for their families, if it's not ha a little more towards the middle of, middle of American sensibility, it's not going to fly off the shelves at the same rate. So I'm really trying to stay mission critical uh, in both in the, the marketability and within staying on the mission of using within 100 miles or 200, what is Green Market now, 250 miles? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm actually you know, 60 miles out from, the, from Union Square, so I have to figure that in. Uh, but you know, that's, that's where we stand, that's where we stand. Let me just uh, show you a few bread pictures. So these are our apple biscuits, uh, lovingly displayed in our backyard. So that's our cheeses and breads together, and we have, um, so these are the, can I reach? I'll point with a five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the flax armadillo. In the basket on the right with the diagonal coupe, we have um, our medieval baguette. So that's the same basic dough as the large medievals, but in a baguette form. And those, these long, thin, 
breads can be baked right at the beginning of our baking day. Uh, we then get, do I have Evie's in this picture? Yeah, here's a rosemary Evie. So that's unbleached wheat, whole oat, whole corn. And that has the cuts, which look so beautiful and have a lot of surface area so it can bake very quickly in a hot oven. We branch out into, um, that's the five. Uh, this is our rustic wheat loaf, which used to be called mommy bread because it's what I made for our children when they couldn't handle the heavy rye, heavy starter flavor, but it has some starter, uh, and that's got corn and oat in it as well. And that's what we're going to taste in a little bit. Uh, so in any case, we um, have the range of sizes and shapes that we can put through the oven as we need to. Uh, and we have range, so ranges of acceptable outcomes and temperature ranges at which we can bake for ideal uh, doneness and crust. Um, and we just keep juggling. We just keep juggling and when new stuff comes on, I like to try it. And, uh, and just keep on the mission of locally grown as ancient a genetic as possible. And, um, understanding the elements of fermentation, the science of gluten strength, and what to do when you have a, a harvest that has a weaker gluten, what can I do in my forming and fermentation techniques that's going to have a beautiful bread that's going to be helpful for the land that it was grown on and the people who eat it on just the middle stage. Um, in terms of cost, uh, it's a tough one because I do have people going, you know, $4.50 a pound for bread, oh my gosh. Where I just, I'm paying real people real money to hand form these breads because they cannot go through a machine where you just punch in the numbers and send it away. Uh, that's one of the things, you know, I do have a dough divider, but all of our doughs are hand formed because our, our um, dough structure is not going to tolerate a machine. Uh, so we do machine mixing machine dividing, but a person is there at every step of the way. Uh, so we have to really be very careful about our numbers. We have to, I look at the weather, and I look at, you know, what's going on at Lincoln Center, and whether we're going to have a lot of people through, or whether, you know, all of, all the buildings are dark, and there's no, nobody going to be coming by. I uh, reach out to the Juilliard parents, come shop at the farmer's market while your kid's taking their music lesson. Uh, you know, we, we really have to uh, be very proactive in our marketing because waste in our bakehouse is very expensive. Uh, that said, I do have restaurants who take our leftovers frozen because these freeze very well. And I am serving you previously frozen bread today, folks, because I left home on Tuesday and you didn't want me to just have it sitting out. Uh, although the medievals keep for about five days before you open them, they're great. Um, we also raise pigs. And we have cheese making, we feed the whey from the cheese making to the pigs, and we soak the breads that are left over to our pigs and to our chickens. Um, I am using emmer wheat uh, from Joel Steinman currently. We have a small flock of chickens, and we're making uh, fettuccine pasta with our own eggs and the emmer wheat. And that's another step in for some folks who haven't eaten any wheat product for 10 years, is to offer them an emmer pasta. And I mean, it's ridiculously expensive. It's $4 for four ounces. I cannot afford to sell it for any less than that. Uh, but for folks who want to eat good food, they're willing to pay for it. And I, you know, one week they buy one, and the next week they buy four. Because uh, it's easier than going out to dinner and not being able to order anything on the menu. So. I had a question about your Emma pasta. Are you blending that? Uh, what's your percentage of Emma to I am not. I'm using 100% emmer. I have to laminate it about 10 t times on the widest setting before I can stretch it. But by laminating it a lot, initially it gets enough of, this, of a matrix that then I can stretch it really nicely. And I make it moderately thin, actually, and one of the comments that I get is that it is light. And, you know, it's certainly not the usual whole wheat sawdust that whole wheat pasta can be. Um, but no, I'm not blending that at all. My only ingredients are eggs and, and flour. 
Yeah. And that's whole wheat emmer flour. That's I'm using the whole wheat emmer flour. Yep. As well as this is the whole wheat at red five. Right. Uh, you know, I did the, I did the sifted, but it wasn't different enough to be worth using both. So I'm just using 100% whole wheat. 